Consciousness is a ghost, a spook, a phantom that somehow spoils the logic of this perfectly balanced clockwork universe, this worldview that we have created for ourselves. It will not be scientific, it cannot be scientific. Uh, actually. So Alan Moore introduced one of the coolest superpowers in comics. Swamp Thing can project his consciousness into the green and regrow it somewhere else. By the end of this video, I promise, you will believe that this is actually plausible in real life. So in the early comics written by Len Wein, Swamp Thing didn't have this power. He could, at best, regrow an arm or something. So when Alan Moore took over writing, the first thing that he did was kill off Swamp Thing in a barrage of bullets and napalm. And this evil corporation gets a hold of the body and they give it to the Floronic Man to dissect it. Floronic Man finds that Swamp Thing doesn't have normal human organs. He has these pulpy vegetable masses where his organs should be. He has vines instead of veins. No human skeleton, no meaty brain. Because the truth is, Swamp Thing never was Alec Holland. Alec Holland died in that lab explosion, and his corpse, coated in his bio-restorative formula, fell into the swamp and was digested by the plant matter. And what arose from the water was a fully floral creature with the memories of Alec Holland. Sound crazy? Well, Floronic Man references a real-life scientific study where someone was able to transfer memories between flatworms, aka googly eye guys. In 1953, Dr. James McConnell did this experiment where he trained planarians to run a maze to get to some food. And then once they knew how to do it, he chopped them up and fed them to other planarians. And then those planarians knew how to run the maze on the first try. This memory transfer breakthrough made McConnell famous. He went on TV shows, he was in the news for years, but nobody could reproduce his results. And so his study just fell out of favor. Until very recently, in May 2018, scientists at UCLA announced that they had done it. Not with planarians, but with something bigger, juicier, sea slugs. Aplysia californica. So these scientists trained the slugs to do tricks with their siphons, and then they extracted RNA from the sensory and motor neurons in these slugs and injected that into new slugs. And then, voila, those new slugs know the tricks. So yeah, up until like a month ago, everybody thought that RNA was just the thing that copied genetic information. But now it seems that RNA might be the thing, the physical place where we keep information information. So how long until we can transfer memories between people? Well, you are more than just your memories, so we're gonna need a few more elements. So as the Floronic Man is explaining Swamp Thing's true nature, he's down there on the slab, and like a plant coming out of hibernation, he regrows a little bit, he wakes up, and he finds this report about himself and reads it. Now, imagine yourself as this character who has spent 10 years trying to just put your lab back together to become a human again, and then reading this and finding out that you never were human. Your memories are not your own. You're a copy, a ghost dressed in weeds. Swamp Thing goes berserk, and he ends up just planting himself back in the swamp and he's catatonic, he's a vegetable. And yeah, if we scratch too hard at the surface of what makes us, us, it can be kind of upsetting. Just ask the guy who wrote the book on it, Consciousness Explained. Dan Dennett, he's a philosopher, neuroscientist, professor, and mall Santa. I have to do a little bit of the sort of work that a lot of you won't like, for the same reason that you don't like to see a magic trick explained to you. Consciousness is a bag of tricks. Recognizing the difference between life and non-life is something we just seem to know. But how do we know? There was a time not that long ago when scientists expected to find some specific thing that made something definitively alive. Like maybe a, a vibrational field or some specific organ. We never found it. Instead, our definition of alive is kind of imprecise. We just describe what a living thing does. If it eats and uses energy, if it communicates and reproduces, then it's alive. I think consciousness is like that too. We're not gonna find some magical force or some specific place in the brain. 
consciousness is just what brains do. So what do brains do? This is a baby sea squirt. When they hatch, they swim around and they look for a nice rock or some place to latch on and settle in. And once they do, they undergo a metamorphosis and they become a simple bivalve pump. They suck water in, filter out the edible stuff, and squirt out the rest. And that's gonna be it for the rest of its life. So the first thing that it does is eat its own brain. It doesn't need it anymore. The remaining nervous system is enough to keep slurping and squirting for the rest of its life. From an evolutionary perspective, the oldest part of your brain handles the basics. Breathing, blood pumping, balance. This part of your brain is pretty similar to a reptile's brain. Our early mammal ancestors evolved a limbic brain on top of that that lets us have uh, more nuanced emotions and memories. And then some mammals evolved a neocortex, those two big wrinkly parts that fit on top. So this is where thinking happens, right? Not exactly. Dennett would say that consciousness doesn't really happen in any one place. What feels like consciousness is the result of all those different pieces having conversations with each other. If that sounds weird, consider split brain patients. People used to sever the connection between the two brain hemispheres if the patient had really bad seizures. Because a seizure is like an electrical storm and it would stop it from spreading to the other hemisphere. But this gets really weird for people because now the two sides of their brain can't communicate. It turns out that muscles and the sense of touch of the right side of the body are controlled by the left hemisphere of the cerebrum and those on the left side of the body are controlled by the right hemisphere. The nerve pathways cross in the brainstem. Test results show that speech is localized in only one half brain. Dr. Gazaniga now reconstructs the test. When a person fixates on a central point, what one sees to the left of that point is projected to the right hemisphere, and what one sees to the right of that point is projected into the left hemisphere. This one researcher, Michael Gazaniga, had a split brain woman look at pictures, and they showed her left eye a picture of a naked person, and the woman just giggled. And they asked her, well, why did you laugh? And she's like, oh, um, that machine over there looked funny to me. What was happening was that the language side of her brain didn't have access to the image of the naked person. So it just made up a reason. And meanwhile, the right side of her brain is locked in there, unable to articulate that, no, we laughed because we saw the naked photo. So this shows that your brain, it's really multiple brains talking to each other. If you've ever talked to yourself, you get it. We have language, the ability to build concepts from smaller pieces. And that's what your brain cells are doing with each other. Have you ever been reading a page and you get to the end and you realize you didn't internalize any of it? Or you're watching a long didactic YouTube video and you're kind of tuning in and out? I get it. You see, part of your brain really is reading that page and part of your brain really is listening to that video, but there's not enough coordination between different brain regions to really put it all together. Because you contain multitudes, and those multitudes can wander in different directions. So, where does it all come together? If all these brain cells are talking to each other, who decides what's at the top, the forefront of our consciousness? Is there somebody in charge who's steering it all? Dennett would say, no, that's not how it works. Yes, your frontal parietal network, those frontal lobes, they do a lot of the higher order introspection and thinking and judgment and stuff, but even within that, you have the same problem again, like who decides what thoughts should be most prominent? Well, consider any other complicated natural system. How does a beehive coordinate itself? How does an ecosystem coordinate the delicate balance of species? Two simple rules, variation and selection. Dennett says that thoughts in your brain are also subject to natural selection. They compete with each other for prominence. They might team up together for their mutual benefit. To have a conscious thought, that thought had to rise through the ranks, to get famous in the brain, to recruit many other neurons in this allegiance of electrochemical echoes. Dennett calls this the multiple drafts model. And all of this exists only in so much as is necessary to determine behavior. So a loud sudden noise might trigger just the right regions to team up to make you jump up and run. Every era uses the dominant technology of its time to try to explain consciousness. The soul is a fire. No, it's, uh, it's something that flows. No, it's, it's a clock. No, it's like the major London telephone exchange. In any one day, 
the average brain makes 100 times as many connections as the entire telephone system of the world. The computer is complex. This is just one part of a large computer's brain. In many ways, the city itself is a kind of brain. It's like the internet. Maybe the dominant metaphor of our time is a distributed network of parallel processors. Or maybe consciousness is like a forest. I spent a bunch of money on improv classes. I'm still not funny, but it did help me understand Dan Dennett's multiple drafts model. So in good improv, everybody on the team is paying attention to everybody else and trying to build the reality together. Improv is a group effort to mind meld around a narrative, moment by moment. Your brain contains 86 billion neurons, 86 billion little improvisers, each with their own quirks and fixations. The self arises from this mess. And you know, it can be really hard and unintuitive to conceive of yourself as a composite or an end product of many smaller selves. But, you know, with the right metaphors for you, you could probably get used to it. Just like Swamp Thing gets used to being not a man, but a Swamp Thing. So we left Swamp Thing comatose in the swamp, traumatized by the loss of his humanity. And while he's under, this is when he learns to connect to the green. And the green warns him that the Floronic Man is trying to use the green to wipe out humanity. So Swamp Thing snaps out of it, does his hero thing, defeats Floronic Man, and he's back on his hero game until he meets Nukeface. Nukeface is a radioactive guy who, with a touch, reduces Swamp Thing's body to a husk. And Swamp Thing is dying. And Abby is scared for him and he tells her, when I was under, I connected to the green and I bet I can put my mind in there. And it works. He's able to put his mind in a little seed and regrow as a little Swamp Thing sprout. And Abby comes and waters him and makes fun of his squeaky little voice. And eventually he regrows into himself. As time goes by, he gets better at regrowing his body faster and faster. He can send his consciousness farther and farther. In fact, at one point, he sends his brain into space and he's able to regrow himself from space plants on some other planet. He sends his mind to this one planet where all the plants are conscious and he accidentally incorporates himself from all of these conscious plants and it's many selves in one, which is very Alan Moore and very germane to what we're talking about today. So what is the self, and how would we send it? That's the promise of this video, right? Well, from the sea slugs, we can infer that our memories are probably stored in the RNA in our neurons, right? So maybe conceivably we could download all of our memories. But it matters how things connect, which memories evoke other memories and everything else. So somehow we would need to map all 86 billion neurons in your brain and put everything in the right place with the right strength connections between them. And then where would you put it? The obvious answer would be some sort of like synthetic body, some artificial intelligence. So where are we with that? At my old job, I got to work with some really smart engineers on machine learning algorithms. Machine learning is when an algorithm has the ability to rewrite its own code to get better at a really specific task. So it kind of works like uh, the way that a baby human learns how to recognize things, right? You show this algorithm thousands of pictures of dogs, and then it sort of develops this idea, this platonic ideal, of what a dog looks like, and then it can recognize dogs in new photos. And you can repeat that for anything you wanted to recognize. This is how facial recognition software works. Companies are also using artificial intelligence to comb through massive amounts of data to look for correlations that a human might not be able to find. But still, all of these examples are task-specific artificial intelligence. It's really a far cry from the kind of integrated information processing that an animal does in its brain. There are some philosophers that say that anything that processes information is technically conscious. So they would say it's a spectrum. A thermostat is a little bit conscious and an alligator is a little more conscious, and then a human is even more conscious. But like Westworld-style AI, that's a long ways off. Nobody is even close to developing the kind of intricate layered algorithms that would be necessary to host a human mind. And there's still so much about the brain that we just don't understand. But I think there is another way. Magic. Much of magic, as I understand it, in the Western occult tradition is the search for the self with a capital S. Dennett ends Consciousness Explained with this passage about how the self 
is something we construct. Just like a spider builds a web, or like a beaver builds a dam, we construct a self, a center of narrative gravity, and we use that to help ourselves survive and reproduce. And not just to reproduce our genes, but to reproduce our memes. Are poems made of ink? No. They're, that's one of the vehicles of which poetry can exist. But there are many things in the world which are basically, I mean, it's a little awkward to put it this way, made of information. And genes are one category, and memes are another. They're just as real as genes. The idea of a chair is perhaps more important than any single individual chair. Magic has quite a lot in common with fiction. The language of magic is more about language than it is about magic. The idea of a grimoire a dark book of spells. Grimoire is simply another way of spelling grammar. To cast a spell is simply to spell. Art is like magic, the science of manipulating symbols, words or images, to achieve changes in consciousness. Your best or worst emotion, your smartest or dumbest idea, those take up physical space in your head and you can put them in somebody else's head with art. Swamp Thing's intelligence is not human. He's like an earth spirit, uh, a very pagan character. That's true. Swamp Thing is the latest iteration of an ancient meme. The green man, the elemental being that's connected to nature. You know, that is Attis, the Greek god of vegetation. It's also Green George, the pagan face of spring. It's a dryad, or a tree ghost of Thailand, or a Japanese Kodama, or this guy from Wizard of Oz. He's the jolly green giant. He's Marvel's Man-Thing and Groot. Osiris, Ningushzita, Shipetotek, Yurilo. These are all harvest deities, but they're also the gods of the underworld in their cultures. Maybe because vegetables grow underground. You know, Swamp Thing, he's familiar with the underworld with death and decay and rebirth in the green. He is, himself, a mutation of a meme that's been going through cycles of death and rebirth since the dawn of human civilization. He slept in tombs and tomes, waiting to regrow himself in another mind, like Morse, or mine, or yours.